So the first verse is Gartulagneya Prapyate Palam Karma Kim Param Karma Tarjanam. So should I read the literal translation and then I will explain the meaning. Okay. The result of an action is obtained according to the laws of the creator. How can the action which is inert be limitless? Okay. Now let us see <coughs> all our life is committed to karma. Okay. We do, in fact all of us when we introduced, we talked about our education, our professional life, our relationships, our family. All this is with reference to a human being is born, comes into the world, observes everybody and everybody somehow is doing the same thing. They all go to school, they look for a profession, they try to succeed in their profession. In the meantime, they look for a life partner, have children, be successful in whatever they are doing, go for a vacation, have some entertainment, okay. retired life, what next? Okay. Whole life is what next? Okay. How, what? Everything is based on actions. Okay. So that means that life is lived with I am an individual. For my fulfillment, I need to do something. Okay. Now this Upadesham Saram starts by saying, Karma Kimparam Karma Tanjadam. Okay. Karma has no solution to what you are looking for. And this is why at any given point in time, nobody can say doing this whatever, whether it is your job or your profession or your expressing your creativity in form of being an artist or a sports person, no matter who is doing what, at no point in time the person can say, I am fulfilled. If you ask the person, starting from Obama to a normal person in Africa or in Australia, are you fulfilled? What will they say? Yes, but. There is always this but. And then that but will have a long list of what is not right in your life. Okay? And this is something that Ramana Maharshi says that hey, the way you are living your life, it is fine, but it is not give, going to give you what you are really searching for. Okay? So this is something that orientation of I have to do something for my fulfillment is something which is very well analyzed in the Veda itself. So all these different things that we do, according to the Veda, human beings have three, four main pursuits. One is the pursuit of Artha, security. Second is Kama, the pleasures. Third is Dharma and fourth is Moksha. Okay. So let us look at what these pursuits are. <coughs> Behind everything that we want to do, what are we really searching for? Okay. So for example, I, I want a job for money. Okay. But what is money? Is money for its own sake? What am I looking for through money, through power, through position? As you saying, you are the king. So many times it came around that I am the king. I can do anything. I, I have access to everything. Okay. So not only that you want to earn, uh, earn money, but you also there is certain power attached. The more, the, why everybody is looking for position? Because there is some power attached and along with power comes, you know, certain feeling of uh, feeling that I am privileged, that things happen according to my wishes. 
Okay. These are all big kicks. It's, it's, it's important. It's very good for nurturing. And this is why everybody goes for that. But these are all falling within one category of what we call Artha. Artha means security. Okay. So I'm looking for money, not for money's sake, but for my security. What can money do for me? It can buy me a nice place to live. It gives me the capacity to educate my children. It gives me the capacity to do whatever, you know, uh, buy some uh, books, buy some goods which I think are, are of use to me. So these are that I feel secure that, okay, now I have money so I will be able to live my life comfortably. So all these pursuit of money, power, position is within the category of what we call artha. Okay. Now is that making you totally secure? At any point in time, you start with uh, uh, you know Steve Jobs when he was alive and he had lots and lots and lots of money. Okay, But can you then, did it actually not only fulfill him or remove that sense of insecurity in him? No. Okay. So there is no end. But what is important to recognize is that if it gave us no security whatsoever, nobody will pursue it because we human beings are rational. Okay. So that means it does make me secured at times. It is true. But it is not giving me the lasting sense of security that I am searching for. What is important to recognize is that all these pursuits are not totally useless. We are not saying that we we'll leave everything and just come to this knowledge. What we have to recognize is every pursuit, what it can give me and what it cannot give me. And what I think it will give me, which it is not capable of giving me. It's just being objective. Okay? We generally move from one extreme to the other. Either our whole life is devoted to money and chasing money or we say money is materialistic and I want to become a spiritual person. So it's almost like a rejection of money as something which is not clean. It's something is labeled as material. Here we are not saying that. We are not. You have to understand that each thing has its own place either giving negative value to it or to give totally positive value is a problem. So understanding that what it can give me, what it cannot give me is objectivity. Okay? So that means the pursuit of security is legitimate. Vedas themselves recognize these pursuits as legitimate. The question is, are these pursuits capable of giving me what I am looking for? What is the answer? Partially, not totally not, partially but not fully. Okay. Now what is the second pursuit? The second pursuit we have of karma, pleasures. Many different forms of pleasures. Okay. And we have different preferences. Somebody loves music. You were saying yesterday that you can listen for hours. Days. Days to music. Okay. So somebody can, uh, somebody loves cricket and they can watch, you know, uh, when we grew up in India, it was like when the, the cricket match started, our school timings were different so that everybody could watch cricket match, you know. So that much is the passion at a national level, you know. So these are all the pleasures and as Europeans, they prefer football. So you have many uh, people watch movies, they move, watch concerts, they, so many different venues, they go on vacation, okay. So, so many different uh, venues uh, through which we satisfy our needs of pleasure. And this pleasure pursuit is not something which is ordinary, okay. The pleasure pursuit is something which is a, a entertainment, is a multi-million dollar industry throughout. Okay? Even this Toyota companies, that is, there is one thing which is just the basic thing, the functional value of a car which is taking you from point A to point B. But so much of it is your image, so much of it is your pleasure of driving 
every ad that you see, how much of it is really thinking and talking about this functional value? It's all about the psychological hype of every product, especially if it is a high-end product. It's all becoming a psychology. All these advertising creative people are just using their brain to make you somehow desire that product and create that demand in you and see that object in a given light which is a cool thing, which is a status thing and then go for it. Okay, That human pursuit of pleasure is something which is a very important pursuit. It cannot be just regarded as some small low pleasure here and there. No. Okay? Even in an airline when you are traveling, all these travel magazines, they all the time create desire in you to travel to some other place. Every time you look at this, <coughs> all these places that you, and beautiful photos and beautiful things and you feel like going there. So that is something which is important pursuit. Now all these pursuits and all of us have gone on vacations, all of us have listened to music, all of us have watched cricket, football, whatever. Have they given us the final fulfillment that we are searching for? But does it mean that they are totally useless? No, because at times they have given us a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes we calm down when we listen to music, we feel absorbed. In cricket match, we forget all our problems and we just get absorbed looking at Sachin Tandulkar. Now he's retired, but you know. So it, cricket <laughs> Exactly, you know, it, it does give us some pleasure. We are not saying that they don't. Okay, but they don't give us exactly, they only partially fulfill us, they don't give us the final fulfillment that we are searching for. There is a third pursuit that Vedas talk about and that is of dharma. Okay, why is dharma a pursuit? Dharma is a pursuit because even though we will analyze it a little bit uh, much more in detail later on and also in the afternoon sessions. Even though all of us know that I have to be honest, that I should not lie, that I should not cheat anybody, I should not hurt anybody. Okay, it's something which is, now according to the Veda, it is not something which needs to be talked to anybody. Because a human being comes with the understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Okay. If everybody knows that it should naturally be incorporated in my behavior, if I know that I should not cheat or if I should not lie, why should I, every, and everybody else knows it, that should become the basis on which human interaction takes place. But does it happen that way? If that was the case, the world would be a very beautiful place to live. So that means in spite of my recognizing what is expected of me with reference to my human relations and what others expect of me and what I expect of others, nobody is able to follow those rules. Okay, even if you think that you are a very honest person, that you have tried not to cheat or not to uh, lie, but when it comes to let's say one thing of hurting, the more close you interact with people, you always end up hurting them. Okay? It's very, very common. Nobody can actually avoid that hurt. Okay, when it's a, the, the um, parent, children, husband, wife. These are the things which are very, very challenging, you know, a boss and a colleague. These are where there is, at times, many times we feel that there is either I have hurt others or others have hurt me. Okay? So that means that this dharma, even though everybody understands, everybody is not able to follow it. And because everybody is not able to follow it, the extent to which it requires some purushatha, it requires an effort on your part to make sure that you do what you understand to be right. That's why it becomes a pursuit. Okay? Just understanding is something which is not enough. And this is why any moral education where people tell you this is what you should do, you should not be angry, you should not be jealous. Is it of any use? 
Just writing on the board. Is, exactly, because you don't want. You know very well that you don't. You you don't want to have problems. <coughs> you don't want to uh, be hurt. You don't want to. Uh, you know, be. Uh, you don't want to be jealous. Nobody wants to be jealous, but it happens, right? So the education is not. You should not. You should not. The education, if that mm. is, how to handle it, and this is what the whole afternoon sessions are going to be. These are all the things that we have to learn to handle. Because just do's and don'ts don't actually serve the purpose. So it requires for you to reflect a little bit more to have that pursuit of dharma in your life. So that means you act based on what you understand and you're not driven by some so-called inside force which makes you do things which is against what you understand to be the right thing to do. In fact, in Mahabharata, there is Duryodhana. He tells once, he says, Janami adharma namre nivruttihi, janami dharma name pravruttihi. Okay? I know exactly what is adharma. I know what is not right. But name nivruttihi. But I cannot, I, I cannot get away from engaging in it. And I know what is dharma, but name pravritti, I cannot I do it, right? So this is something that now how to do that, right? How do you then align your actions with what you understand is what we call the pursuit of dharma. Okay? And that is the, the third pursuit, which is a very important pursuit. Our Vedas, we have to understand one thing. They are not saying give up your securities, give up your pleasures, it validates it, it talks about it, okay? but at the same time it says do that but incorporate dharma. Right? Your pursuit of money is not bad but if you lose sight of what is right and what is wrong in the pursuit of money then it's a problem. Pleasures are not a problem. But if for your going on a vacation you have to lie and get some money from somebody so that you can enjoy, that becomes a problem. Hard to get to steal the money. Steal the money, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> then go on a vacation. <laughs> then it becomes a problem, right? So that means dharma is something which is in line. You can do your security, the pursuit of artha and kama is fine, but it has to be in keeping with dharma to live a conflict-free life. Okay? So this is what we say, the pursuit of dharma. Now, is that most of the time people think that's the highest thing as a human being that we can achieve is to live a dharmic life. And that's why many people ask, you come to Vedanta, they say, no, I don't want to come to Vedanta, I'm honest, I'm doing things right, I don't hurt anyone, I'm living my life, uh, you know, with ethics, so I don't need Vedanta. What does it mean? It Has, means... Have we achieved the ultimate in that? Absolutely. That I have achieved the ultimate if I'm able to live a dharmic life. But is dharmic life giving you what you are really looking for? What are we looking for? Ultimately, what a human being is looking for is fulfillment. Okay? Shanti, peace. Unqualified. Not shanti, but. but. <laughs> you know? So this fulfillment, this sense of that adequacy, this sense of that completeness, can dharma make us achieve that or not? Can it? No? Why? I would say I because don't know. Exactly. I don't know, can, not yet. At least for I us, we can only think about yeah. ourselves and many times what happens is, many times we look at the world, people, it's a very common comment that people make. It says, I've been very dharmic, I have been doing right things and see my lot. Okay? And look at this other person who is yes, employing all kinds of things and see he's driving Mercedes Benz and he has his beautiful house and everything. So there is almost this thing of life is unfair. There is this whole underlying assumption that goodness 
or uh, you know being a too uh, a, a nice person doesn't really pay there is something which is not right okay so this is something which is a common feeling of everyone which shows something which is very important that dharma even though it is the very fabric of our being does not give us the absolute satisfaction that we are looking for because there is some dissatisfaction because i view the world i look at myself i look at my behavior okay and i look at the behavior of others and it seems as though the compensation is not just okay so there is this dissatisfaction that continues even though the person is highly dharmic okay so that means dharma is again even though it's a very essential part of living a, a good life it is not an end in itself okay so this is why our scriptures talk about the fourth pursuit and this is exactly ravana maharshi starts by saying the pursuit of artha kama and dharma will not get you param will not get you para what you are looking for total fulfillment but human life is such that you cannot just settle for saying that you are just doing whatever and i will not get what i am really looking for the whole pursuit of human being is i want to be satisfied i want to be complete i want to be fulfilled okay so there is, is it not coming out of what is called desire so not this is kama no not kama yeah. we will see it's analyzed okay so now he um uh, the fourth pursuit is what we call moksha okay the moksha is asking me asking a very very potent question the question is what am i ultimately looking for in life is fulfillment i have all these pursuits of artha dharma and kama which are all based on karma actions okay i don't have the job i need to get it i don't have the education i have to get it i have to go to this place for a vacation i need to go and watch this movie i need to go and watch this concert these are all what actions okay so artha dharma and kama and i want to be sensitive to others so that i act properly all actions this actions will not get me what i am looking for so what is moksha then moksha is how then do a, what is the solution to the fulfillment that i am searching for okay in order to answer that there this is where we enter so called spiritual world okay and within the spiritual world because now i have understood that my normal pursuits don't get me what i am searching for so now i am in the so called search i am i am a person who begins to search and for this person who is beginning to search there is a so called spiritual world where there are many different options so many you know i used to live in the us and there are all these spirituality magazines and each one has I mean, each magazine has so many different articles on different people promising you different things through different techniques to get what you are looking for so that means there are again in the so called spiritual world there are so many options somebody is teaching meditation somebody is telling you to do some practices somebody is asking you to do some karma yoga somebody is asking you to have some special experience there are all kinds of things that are available what are you going to choose and based on what criteria shastra otherwise we are all seekers you know and we try so many different things there is one thing that we have to understand shastra talks about okay for this moksha the freedom right that i am searching from freedom from insecurity freedom from unhappiness freedom from sense of incompleteness that i am searching for okay there is only one solution the solution is coming through logic the logic is the following if i am a limited person that is my starting point okay looking for something 
which is limited, whether it is normal pursuit of money, normal pursuit of going on a vacation, or a pursuit of sitting and doing something in the name of spiritual being, spiritual practice. Okay? A limited person doing a limited action based on <coughs> limited effort is never going to find freedom from limitation. This is the logic which is a very powerful logic. It is impossible. Okay? That means if anybody is telling you that I'll give you this practice and you have to do this to get this, that is never going to be the solution. The only solution is that you are already free from the limitation. If, if you are really limited, no action will make you, a limited action will not make you free from limitation. The only solution is I am already free. If I am already free, why do I think I am limited? Because of who I think I am, this is what we call the self-conclusion that I have about myself. For everybody's starting point is I am limited and I have to do something to gain that fulfillment. Shastra says that very conclusion that you have, I am limited, is wrong. Any solution you look, giving reality to this basic premise is never going to give you what you are searching for. So it's a paradigm shift. It is questioning, re-questioning, re-understanding my real nature. Okay? So this is the nature of the teaching and this can be the only solution to what I'm searching for. The pursuit of moksha turns, when I understand this reality, turns into what we call jignasa. Jignasa is natum echa, the desire to no, no. Because my freedom is going to come from not yet another doing one spiritual practice, but by knowing my true nature. Examining my conclusion about myself that I am a limited person who has to do something, whether what we call material or spiritual, for getting what I want to be is never going to be the solution. So that means the only, now the pursuit becomes knowing my true nature, examining am I limited or not. Okay. So this is where he starts by saying that the, uh, the action will not give me the result. Now one thing that we have to um, understand that the orientation to karma is not something which is just we all of us do. The orientation to karma is something which also is part of big philosophies that we all have. Okay, So uh, in the Veda itself, uh, uh, people look into the Vedas and uh, they are great scholars. And they say, what is the purport of Veda? What is Vedanta asking us to do? So there are what we call Purva Mimamsaka who look at the first portion of the Veda, Karma Kanda, which is giving you many different prayers and rituals to accomplish your Artha and Dharma. They say that Karma is the ultimate. Okay, So it's not just a conclusion of a normal human being. Even the philosophers, the orientation of Karma is something which is so strong that even the philosophers conclude that um, karma is the end, that is the only purpose of human life. Okay? So what do Purva Mimam Saka say? You have to know. They say that Veda is giving us different means to get what we are looking for. Okay? So that means there is one thing which is a known means. Known means means I want, let's say, my promotion. And I try everything that I have in my hand. Right? I, I work hard, I try to network with whoever I want to do, I, I acquire enough skills to do the job 
for which I need, uh, you know, which uh, for which I want to get promotion. Okay. So these are all the things that we do. These are our known variables. Okay. But in spite of doing all of this, is there a guarantee that I'm going to get what I'm looking for? Nobody can be hundred percent sure. Your boss may be pleased. May not be pleased. Who knows? Exactly. Absolutely. So that means there is, as far as my satisfying that desire is concerned, there is always an uncertainty as to whether it is going to happen or not. So what Vedas give me is some kind of a prayer or a ritual, okay, to take away some of the obstacles which I don't know what those obstacles are, to improve my possibility of getting that promotion. So that means the first portion of the Veda is giving me the known end. I have a known end, my promotion, and it gives me unknown means. Right? Because the means that I know are working hard, networking, acquiring skills. These are my known means. But there are some unknown means. I don't know how, you know, is all equate, how this thing is going to result into what I'm looking for or not. So it gives me the unknown means to acquire known ends. That is one. It also gives me the unknown means to acquire unknown results. What? Going to heaven. Can any one of us know that there is heaven? <laughs> Nobody knows. So Veda talks about one heaven which is an unknown end, right? And it also tells me certain means to do Sandhya Vandanam every day, which is also unknown to me, otherwise just intuitively I don't know. So it gives me the unknown, for unknown end, unknown means. Okay, so this is what the Vedas does. Or it can give me an unknown uh, end, which is heaven, and it says, you be honest. So, known means. Or it can say that <coughs> if you are a good human being, it will give you conducive situations in the future. Unknown to me. Known ends, unknown means. Unknown ends, unknown means. Known and unknown means. All the different permutations and combinations. And this is the only thing that Veda is doing. So it's still very much karma oriented. So that means that this conclusion that karma will get me everything is not just a conclusion of a common man. You can be a great scholar looking into the Veda and still conclude that karma is an end in itself. It is only in Vedanta, in the Upanishads, this whole premise is questioned. Okay, So this is where we say that actually even if you get all this, is it really going to solve your problem? And if it is not going to solve your problem, then what is the solution? The solution lies in knowing yourself. Okay, So this is something that you have to know that the orientation of karma giving me the final result is something which is questioned and in the very first verse it is negated. It is 10.15, we started a little bit late. So should I end here? In the next class we will continue. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nar Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om